Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Laura McBrayer is the author of Like a House on Fire. She is a graduate of Yale with a law degree from UC Berkeley. A working mom of three, she is the head of business affairs for an entertainment company in Los Angeles. Like a House on Fire is her adult debut. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Like a House on Fire, the novel. Thank you so much for having me. I don't think I've read another book lately where within just a few pages, I'm like, oh, I would be friends with that person writing this book. <laughs> when there's a scene in the beginning where you have one of the, you have like this job interview and the frazzled mom is like, I just need to get out of the house. Can you hire me so I can like just get out of the house? And I was like, that is perfect. <laughs> Well, and I think that the people, the experience I've had talking to readers is women who are doing the juggling act, who have kids, who have careers or had them or are trying to figure out, you know, what to do. Maybe they're going back to work. There is an affinity for the experience. And I, but I find that readers who, there, there are plenty of readers who don't have that experience of merit, who sort of think, she's all over the place or she's really selfish or why does she have this internal monologue that she doesn't communicate, you know, to her husband, you know, straightforwardly. But I think moms who are in it or so we recognize ourselves in her, at least I hope um, that was the intention. Are there people without internal monologues? <laughs> is, that, is that a thing? <laughs> I think there are. And I think there are people who don't want to acknowledge ambivalence about parenting. You know, I mean, we all love our kids. We love, I mean, maybe we don't all love our kids. We hope that most of everyone loves their kids. I love my kids, you know, but there are moments when it's a real, it's a real struggle for personhood and identity and, and sort of sanity and mental quiet and you know, all these things. So I think that Merit is a woman who's just with us, the reader, really honest about her experience and yep. I think that there are women who relate to that and and some who maybe don't or find that, you know, challenging or off-putting or whatever. Yes. And the other great part is that her prospective boss and then her boss finds it hilarious, right? That's the other good thing. And that she's like hysterically laughing and like texts her for drinks immediately. And I, you know, that she, I mean, it could have gone the wrong way, right? I guess is what you're saying. She could have been horrified, right? But Ooh. if you... <laughs> But no, she gets it. And I think the the thing that I'm trying to to do in that first interview scene, so you know, setting up for people listening, you know, merit. Yes, I'm sorry, Lauren. What is your? Can you please tell? I'm sorry. Can you please tell listeners what your book is about? Yes, I I have been lately calling like a house on fire a midlife coming of age. Mm-hmm. It's the story of a woman named Merit who's in her late 30s when we meet her. She's the mother of two very young kids. And she's coming back to the workforce after taking several years off to both raise her two boys, you know, who are, who are little, and then also pursue a career in fine art, which is her passion, her creative joy that she set aside in her 20s to be an architect. And when she had kids, she wanted to get back to doing the creative thing. So she leaves the workforce to paint and raise her kids and Neither of those things work out quite as she thought. She has a failed gallery show. She fails as a painter. And she realizes that if she stays home with her two kids, who she does love very much, she might go insane. So she decides to go back to work in part for those reasons, but also because her marriage is struggling a bit with the financial pressures her staying home has caused. And so she thinks going back to work as an architect will reinvigorate both her own life and also her marriage. And so she, the first chapter, she's in the interview at this new job working for this incredible Danish architect named Jane, who's 20 years older and fabulous and has no kids and, you know, lives sort of this 
from Merritt's perspective, aspirational, liberated life. So the two are an odd pairing. And the novel is a story of their relationship and the intimacy that develops between women when there is no expectation, which is what I I wanted to create these two characters who on paper will not be close friends and certainly will not be friends outside of work and certainly won't potentially fall in love. But anyway, so that first scene with Jane, you know, Merritt is bringing her tired mom self. Her kids have been up all night. She says she feels like her eyes have been washed in bleach. And what happens in that interview is without really trying, Merritt wins Jane over. And I, I, there wasn't a lot of effort. Merritt's not like amazing in the interview. She doesn't say anything particularly, you know, funny or witty or smart, but Jane just gets her from the outset. And they just have, they click, you know, the way people, some people do. So that's the beginning of their relationship that develops over time and involves wine and oysters and cake pops. And (laughs) did you have, are are you having an event or did you have an event already with all of those elements? Elements, Not the cake pops. I should have, I should have done. That's a great idea. Zibby. Thanks for teaching. Could you have told me that before the, before? I mean, that's why I would have gone is for the cake pops is why I'm asking. (laughs) And in the novel, they're laced with pot at one one point. So um, maybe I should have done that. No, just kidding. Yeah. Well, maybe two different, two different sections yeah. of the party. <laughs> okay, so how did this novel come to you? This is your first novel. Tell me about the whole thing. Tell me about, like, did you always want to write? Where did this come from? Is this your first novel, actually, or just the first published novel? It is not my first pu- novel, actually, and also not my first published novel, act- in truth. I published three young adult novels. Okay. I'm like, it looks, I said, it says it's her debut. debut. Well, they're clever. They say um, adult debut. I wrote three young adult novels under my maiden name. uh, The last of which came out in 2017. Uh, They were Harper Teen books. They were radically different than this novel. And so, you know, this felt really different voice-wise and tonally and content-wise. So we, you know, it is my adult debut, but also it's just so different that it mm-hmm. felt like the right thing to do for the marketplace too. I didn't want any, you know, 12 year old teen girls picking right. up this novel. Your warning, it's for adults. Um, so I had written these three young adult novels. And after my third, which came out in 2017, I knew I did not have another YA book in me. I just, I felt just with clarity, whatever I had been doing or saying for the teen readers, you know, there just wasn't another story in me. And there was a bit of a creative desert that happened after that. And, and I think part it was the, in part, it was the book come came out and part, it was that I just had my third child and, you know, with every kid, it gets exponentially harder as moms know. And so I was dealing with that and sort of the depletion that came after that. And I just wasn't sure what I wanted to write. And I was, I had this feeling that I wanted to write a memoir, but I didn't, have anything to write about. Like I wasn't <laughs> sure what the memoir would be. And I, I did, I wasn't self-important enough to think like, oh, people need to hear from me. But I just, it was this, this instinct to sort of write something that was deeply personal. And I was on a girls weekend with some women, one of whom was a close friend and the rest I didn't know very well. And I fell asleep by the pool reading conversations with friends actually, and woke up with these two characters, Merritt and Jane in my, in my head. Like I could hear them speaking to each other clearly. Their names were different then, but they, they were so fully formed as characters. And I saw what I thought was the arc of the novel. It was, you know, the same sort of setup and they meet and the age difference in, in my head initially it was sort of like a one night they cross over and then realize the friendship's too important. That's what I thought I was writing. So, uh, you know, I just was like, this is interesting. You know, this feels different. And I, I started writing and it literally just poured out. I mean, it was just, it was very clear. I knew what I was doing. I didn't need to plot it or outline it the way I had with my YA novels, which were, you know, heavily plotted. And I knew everything that was going to happen ahead of time. This just organically, these characters told me who they were and how they felt about each other and and also that their relationship would not cross over for just one night. They were like, what do you think we're doing here? We've come this far. (laughs) So in the process, maybe like six months in, it took me about a year to write this book. Six months into it, I could no longer ignore that there were some deeply personal strands in my own life that had been completely in my subconscious. I mean, I don't even, I'm not exaggerating to say I literally had no idea that there would be anything personal in my own life that would be motivated by this book. 
And so there came to a point where I realized, oh, I'm writing a memoir of the future. Like I'm writing something deeply personal that hasn't actually happened. I mean, and it's not something that will happen, but I guess it's like an alternate history or my alternate history or something. And it enlivened me. I mean, that's the only word I can think of. I mean, I came alive in the process of writing this book, which was extraordinary, but, you know, in the wake of it has been a some dramatic life changes, similar to the ones Merritt makes in in the novel. So yeah, so that's, it was sort of, it was birthed out of this desire to write a memoir. And I thought in the beginning, it was the the biggest leap, you know, creatively I'd ever taken. I was like, I'm going to write about a woman who falls in love with a woman. Like, I don't know anything about that, you know? And by the end of it, I was like, oh, she's me. Why didn't anybody tell me that along the way? So does this mean you have fallen in love with a woman? I haven't fallen in love with a woman, but I have left my marriage to a man of 15 years and dating women and I'm living life like as a queer person, which I never would have imagined. I came up with the idea for the book three years to the day before it came out. My pub date, you know, selected by Putnam was April 26th. April 26th, 2019 was when this idea, you know, these women arrived in a thunderclap in my mind. And, you know, in three years... I went from one version of myself to a radically different one, all motivated by a book. You know, I wrote myself, I gave myself permission through the book to explore the questions I would have been terrified to ask in real life. And so I think that's the gift of writing. I mean, I just, I encourage people to just write the story and write it, you know, metaphorically, write it completely fictionally, like just give yourself permission to like, let your imagination run wild and see where it takes you. I mean, be prepared. It might take you somewhere you don't expect, but anyway. That is amazing. It's like a novel of, of empower. It's like finding your voice through these women's voices. And then you actually acted on Like, that's so great. That's amazing. I think well, it's amazing. and it's interesting, you know, people, you know, as a, another sort of like warning to people, there is infidelity in the novel. And as you can imagine, people have strong feelings, you know, about infidelity. It's there were some publishers actually, as my advice, like, do you have any advice to aspiring writers? I was like, don't write about affairs, harder to sell. But the infidelity for me in this novel was a, it's a, I mean, not a device that sort of minimizes it, but I needed Merritt and Jane to, like I said, have no expectation. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you think that someone you meet, there's a potential for a romantic future, all of your decisions are guided by that, mm-hmm. you know, inkling, even if it's just in the back of the head. And I think, you know, the old when Harry met Sally concept of men and women can't be friends. You know, if it had been a male boss and a female employee, you're always thinking, is there mm-hmm. something between them? You know, so I needed Merritt to be married. I needed Jade to be married at the outset. You know, I needed Merritt to never have considered that she could fall for a woman or certainly be attracted to one. Or So it sort of was became the constraints of the novel to, to allow me to give these women that complete lack of expectation that they would end up together. So anyway, it's, I mentioned that just because it's, it's funny that it, there, there is a, there is infidelity at the center of the novel, but it's not really a novel about an affair, or at least that hasn't, wasn't how I was constructing it, if that makes sense. I feel like there are so, I feel like there's so many books with infidelity. Is it because it's written by a woman? Like what, or is it because the infidelity is with a woman like, I, I feel like that's such a common thing in movies and in books and, you know, that's yeah, just like I, one of those devices. So that, well, and I mean, Esther Perel says, you know, estimates are like, could be in the 80, 80% that pe- of people who have an affair. So it's right it's a very active part of the human experience. I think, yeah, there are tons of stories with affairs. I think there are publishers, understandably, or or editors in particular that are really reticent. I mean, actually at Putnam, the first editor we submitted to was like, this is an amazing story. I don't publish infidelity. Here's a colleague who I think will like it. Interesting. Yeah. So a little tip for little tip huh. writers. Wow. So how do you feel? You have a whole new life. You're an adult novelist. You're dating. You're not the mom at home wondering what to do. You're like, what? It, now what? How do you feel? Like, are you excited? Are you scared? Are you happy? All of the above. D, mm-hmm. all of the above. It is, it's a terrifying but exhilarating experience. You know, I think like Merritt, I didn't feel like I had any reason to be unhappy, you know, you know, five years ago, three years ago. I had three healthy, wonderful kids. I have a 
I had a kind and decent, hardworking husband, you know, I had friends, a community, a life, you know, a job, uh, all these things. And I, I was really asleep at the wheel and I, but I didn't, I couldn't look inside because I didn't want to mm-hmm. figure out why I was so unhappy. I'm sort of predisposed to happiness. So I, I, I'm not a melancholy person. I'm, you know, so I was sort of like, it's all fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, I mean, it's great. But speaking of internal monologue, a turning point for me was in early 2017, actually maybe, maybe early 2018. I went to a family fun night at my kid's school. Uh, my, my older two were, were involved in the I'll call them festivities. I it's madness. It's one of those color borders. <laughs> you know, they have like the chalk. Yes. yes. Like, we all hear about toxic things. Surely this can't be good for their lungs. It's like artificial colors sprayed all over them. They're screaming. There's loud music. It's hot because it's, you know, summer in LA or May in LA. And I had my youngest in a stroller and I'm pushing him around and I realized and I have never felt completely at home with the moms who stay home full time because they have time to network and chit chat and spend time together. So they have a close knit group. And then there are the really busy, high powered, like career moms who, you know, work all the time and sort of have a support system for them. I was kind of this flexible schedule, creative, but I also had a day job. I just never felt like I had school moms who are close friends. So anyway, I'm, I'm pushing the stroller around at this event. Everyone's talking. People seem happy, laughing. And I realized all of a sudden that I had no thoughts in my head. <laughs> I, I, had no it was me. I was like, who am I? Where did I go? I'm not thinking anything. I'm just pushing the stroller and looking at these screaming children. And it, it kind of woke me up because the realization I was like, this isn't me. I'm not this person pushing a stroller with no thoughts who just am shuffling around in like bad jeans. This is where did I go? And I think a lot of moms have that moment, you know, of sort of like, this has been great. I love being a mom. I love being wrapped up in my kids' lives. But then at some point I've gone too far and I've lost myself in these roles. And I think particularly if we're a wife and a mom and we have a job and we have a creative pursuit and we try to be a good friend and, you know, we show up for people, we have, we're involved in charities. It's like, we're so involved and we're playing so many roles that the kind of the meanness, the meanness of me, I think got kind of lost. Anyway, for me in that moment, it was like, who am I? I need to get myself back. And I think that was the beginning for me to really start to ask questions. And I think that's why I wanted to write a memoir. You know, it's like, I need something that's deeply mine. You know, I need to feel like I have something to say. Anyway, so life now is, it's in a lot of ways the same. You know, I'm still the same mom. I have, you know, my my parents have had a more difficult time with the transition. And I'm sort of like, I'm not going to suddenly present as a different person. I'm still the same me, you know. Um, <laughs> so things feel different, but in a lot of ways, the same, you know, doing the same stuff, working the job, doing the, writing the books, raising the kids, being <laughs> a friend. You know. What is your day job beside from this? Yeah, I work in the TV business and I do what we call business affairs, which I was a lawyer, went to law school and did, you know, legal for film and TV for many years and then crossed over to the business side. So I negotiate, I basically buy books uh, for TV shows and negotiate the deals for writers and directors and actors. So business side of TV and then creative side of publishing. Amazing. Well, maybe I'll send you my memoir and you can see what you think. I would love it. I would love it. (laughs) <laughs> that's been anxiously awaiting to be clear. Uh, I mean, well, we have, there are a lot of sort of thematic similarities in our stories of life, yeah. which went into literature. I didn't write a memoir. You know, you said, I didn't think, you know, I didn't want people to think I had, I was important enough. I felt like I needed to write the memoir too, not because I was important in any way. I wasn't, but just that there was something about the story I had to get out, right? Yeah. That you feel like people will relate to and all of that. So, and you know, also, I mean, I'm 45 now, but I, I made all these big life changes just before 40. And I always wonder, you know, it's like the sliding doors of my own life. What if I had stayed on that path? Like I'm on a radically different path. I certainly wouldn't be here doing a podcast talking to you. Do you know what I mean? Like there were so many experiences I've, and people I've met and, you know, I, and then it just makes me think like all the people listening who can be inspired by a book like yours, like A House on Fire and and the stories of people who, I mean, there's so many people, like you say, who are sleepwalking and feel trapped or just it's, you know, woe is me. You know what I mean? Like, okay, everything's fine. But well, is I- it? But is it? And like, we only get this one chance. 
I don't know. Well, no. And I, I mean, I so appreciate, appreciate that about you of sort of, and I can relate to this too. When I see it, I'm like, oh, I, ha- I, that's, I get that. The sort of like, I came up with an idea today. I mean, I saw you're going to bring back. <laughs> it's sort of like, I came up with an idea today. There is no time like the present to do this thing. Cause I could be like, oh, that would be cool. If I brought that podcast back, maybe I'll do that next year when I'm less busy. It, you know, never, <laughs> never less busy. I mean, Zibby Owens is never less busy, but that sort of thing of like the moment is now and yes. this is the only life I have and I have to seize, you know, seize the moment. And I think for women, I mean, it was definitely true for me. 40 was the thing. I mean, yeah. 40 was the year I told my husband I wanted a divorce. 40 was the year, you know, I moved out. I mean, all these things I think happen to women at this point in life because it's this this kind of reawakening for so many of us after we've done all the things that society mm-hmm. tells us we're supposed to do. We got married. We earned money or did something to contribute to a a family. And then we had children. And so it's like, now we're set and we're going to ride that out for the rest of our lives. And for some people, I think that's perfectly satisfying. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us are like, Oh wait, but I'm, I'm happy I did those things, but I, there's so much more I need to do it. And I think for a lot of people, they can do it in the context of the existing marriage, you know, the existing life. But for me, I, I needed to make these changes, you know, I needed to make these changes and everyone in my family is more alive now. You know, we were all a little bit, even my kid, you know, even the kids, you know, the subtle sort of like deadness of a mom with no internal monologue. I think, I mean, I just, anyway, people worry a lot about my kids, but my kids are doing great. Yeah. I I mean, I probably should, when I told some people that I was first, you know, getting divorced or whatever, they were like, but your kids, you know, and like, my kids are amazing right now. My kids are great. They're better than ever. Like, I mean, who knows? Right. But I don't know. Having a happy mother, happy, fulfilled, like, you know, excited. Like I wake up excited every day. Like I can barely even sleep, (laughs) you know, and you know, that's not lost on kids. Like, and also the potential also that you can just do whatever, not, I mean, in, I, th- not, I don't mean it like that. That came out wrong, but just that, like, you know, well, we're, that we're liberated. I mean, that that women and, and their parents are are there's a freedom there, and not a freedom to, you know, behave badly or make bad choices or hurt people, but sort of that nothing. You're not stuck in right. life, and I, you know, even, I, even just the creative side of it, you know, even just like look, you can write a novel. Like, look what I just did. I just wrote this thing, and now it's out in the world. Like. You guys can do this too. Like if I could do it, you can do it. Like how, I mean, it's it's a powerful message. So I think we connect to, I think the people who are responding, you know, really well to my novel and the people who respond to, to bookends, this idea of, you're not trying to be aspirational in like a prescriptive way of like what you should do if you're unhappy in your marriage is fall in love with a woman and leave. No, you're like, here's my unique story. And I don't mean, you know, it's not a memoir, but here's this slice of a, a character in her journey. Yep. And the thing you connect to is desire. And I don't necessarily even mean romantic desire. It's like, mm-hmm. here's a woman who decided what it was that she wanted. Yep. It wasn't what people told her what she wanted, what she should do. It's not the societal roles prescribed to her. Oh, this is a thing I want, whether it's a new career, it's a person, it's like to go live in Paris, you know, whatever it is, Right. I, there's something that connects of like seeing a person identify what it is they want and who it is they really want to be. And I, like, I, like you said, I think it trickle happiness is contagious or contentment anyway. So I also think people respond a lot more to hearing a story, whether it's a novel or a memoir or just sitting there telling your story. Like that inspires more change, I think, sometimes than like, here are the six, let me give you the six steps to, you know, making your life better. People are too smart for that. You know, not not just, I mean, that is good too, because people need to know the, the path to achieving things, like not to rain on the parade of, of those prescriptive type things. But I do think there is something from the dawn of time, right? Where storytelling is is the thing that connects us all in a way and and really, yeah. you know, hits home. So I mean it sounds so obvious and stupid, but anyway. No, it does I mean, but it doesn't. And I think that the the grayness of stories, that things can't be black and white in a story. It's not as simple as do X, Y, and Z and all these amazing things will happen. I mean there's a line in the novel where Jane says to Merritt, you know, there's beauty and loss in every direction. And mm-hmm. I think 
that that's true in life when we make decisions. And it's a, you have to accept the loss with the beauty. And so I think what stories do for us is they allow us to really sit in the nuance of Mm -hmm. there's no merit, there's no right or wrong, at least in my perspective of what merit should do. It's just what she did. And it's just who she is. And, you know, sometimes we become the worst of ourselves in order to eventually be the best. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that about people and, you know, one, at one event, you know, a reader raised her hand and said, you know, I, I love this book and I loved who Merritt was when she was with Jane, but when she was home with her kids and with her husband, I just really didn't like her. And I was like, great. Glad you had an emotional reaction. Also, Merritt didn't really like herself. That's mm-hmm. sort of the point. She didn't want to be like the whiny nag, like shuffling dishes and snapping at her kids and rewarding them with TV when they haven't earned it just to make them like be quiet, you know, but it's, that's real life. At least it is in my house. It's, we're not always exemplars. We were human. And, and I think there's something beautiful in that. So anyway. Totally. Okay. I know we're almost out of time, but I feel like I want to like sit and have coffee with you or whatever. So maybe we'll have to continue this offline at some point. (laughs) Are you working on another novel or project now? And then what's your advice for aspiring authors? I am, I am working on a new project now. It is the hardest thing I've ever done because it's not unlike like a house on fire. This one is dancing in front of me sort of elusively as I'm trying to grasp it and be like, wait, what is it? What is it? I'm trying to let this story idea just reveal itself. And I'm going to be very patient. Uh, it's the story of a woman who like Merit, but, but different, her whole world falls apart. And for this character, it was not of her own doing. And she's left to kind of figure out her own personal history and who she wants to be. But the key for this book I'm working on is the backdrop of California and using colonialism and the, how religion impacted the history of California and indigenous people and how that's a metaphor and a parallel to the patriarchy and, you know, women's bodies are colonized by male dominated society, just like California was colonized by male dominated religious society and just the parallels between those things. I just want to look at yeah. the ways in which we assimilate as women and mm-hmm. as conquered people and what that does to culture. So that's the book. It's a okay. uh, monster, but I'm working on it. And my advice to aspiring writers would be, you know, believe in the story. And I've never actually given this advice, but it just came to me now. It, it Believe that the story is worthy and exists outside of you. Mm-hmm. And that you're not responsible to to figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. You're just responsible to tell it the best that you can. And I think the the problem with that is I get in my own head. I'm trying to muscle it. I'm trying to well, how can I figure it out? I got to figure it out. And every time, like every experience of writing anything, whether a short essay or a novel, it reveals itself. Just if you if you sit there and you're patient and you're a student of the idea and you ask it questions, you know it'll reveal itself. It's not really up to you. Mm-hmm. Your job is to just button chair, write as many words as you can, and then come back the next day and do it again. And just trust that the story will live, you know, whether you figure it out or not, it'll, it'll figure it itself out. I love that. As my husband says, it'll all unfold organically. <laughs> okay, really great, honey. Yeah. Everything has a shit. Everything has a shit. Well, Lauren, this has been so fun and I'm so glad to have, you know, stumbled on you and your book. Well, not stumbled. I mean, you know, you know what I mean? Connected with both the book and the person. And anyway, thank you. This has been really interesting. Thank you for having me. It's been great. My pleasure. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.